So welcome to Encore Learning Presents. And today we have, we cover a topic um, of how the East and West cultures uh, often uh, um, uh, diverged and went in different directions. Uh, this has been true in the, in the past and, and also we see it uh, in the present uh, day as well. And to help tell the story, we draw on observations uh, from Marco Polo, that's the historian, not the uh, popular pool game, Marco Polo, although that would be certainly apropos in the uh, uh, hot uh, summer days we have now. And um, so, but introduce our uh, guest speaker today. So today we have uh, Art uh, uh, Wenk. Uh, he's a true Renaissance man. He has authored a number of books covering topics from art, music, history, as well as scientific matters. Uh, this presentation actually draws from one chapter in his book, History, the Arts and Ideas, and I highly recommend that book. It has a lot of very interesting topics. His career path has been just as diverse as his writings include um, being a mu musicologist, a calculus teacher, psychotherapist, and finally, church musician and choral conductor. He is joining us from Fort Myers, Florida, one of the benefits of, uh, of, of being a virtual presentation. And I'm certainly looking forward to his uh, presentation. So um, please uh, welcome Art Wink. And uh, Art, you can go ahead and, uh, and share your PowerPoint. And as soon as the virtual applause uh, dies down, you can uh, <laughs> go ahead and begin your presentation. But thanks for joining us, Art. Um, all right. We Great. See it. Thank you. Take it away. I hope to have an opportunity later on to explain what the matrix of Western culture has to do with this. But today I'm going to focus on three sections, the Silk Roads, Marco Polo, and the Great Divergence. Um, okay. We in the West tend to have a skewed view of geography. See if the following statement doesn't apply to you. Many of us even grew up believing that this West has a genealogy according to which ancient Greece begat Rome, Rome begat Christian Europe, Christian Europe begat the Renaissance, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment political democracy and the Industrial Revolution, industry crossed with democracy, in turn yielded the United States, embodying the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For us, the map of the world, or at least the world that matters to us, tends to focus on Western Europe. Today's presentation requires a geographical reorientation into areas that many of us find unfamiliar, at least in the sense that we might have difficulty outlining this map from memory. According to current thinking, human civilization sprang up independently in a number of areas, the earliest being the so-called Fertile Crescent around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in what is now Iraq. The first complex societies, marked by division of labor and some form of political structure, date from around 4000 BC. Hammurabi, the head of the Babylonian Empire, disseminated the first recorded laws around 1700 BC. There's the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire was succeeded by the Persian Empire, which had its greatest extent around 500 BC. The Persian Empire was a land of plenty that connected the Mediterranean with the heart of Asia. Trade flourished in ancient Persia, providing revenues that allowed rulers to fund military expeditions targeting locations that brought in yet more resources into the empire. The place names have changed, but you can orient yourself around the Mediterranean and the Arabian Seas and India. For Alexander the Great, as for all ancient Greeks, culture, ideas, and opportunities, as well as threats, came from the East. It was no surprise that his gaze fell upon the greatest power of antiquity, Persia. Alexander the Great defeated the Persians and achieved his greatest expanse of land around 300 BC. Before long, all the points along the royal road that linked the major cities of Persia 
and the communication network that connected the ghost of Asia Minor with Central Asia had been taken by Alexander and his men. The large area labeled Bactria is now part of Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan, if you return it again to our basic orientation map. The Roman Empire, based on constant expansion, endured for centuries until it could no longer defend its most distant borders. Taking over one coastal city-state after another, Rome came to dominate the Western Mediterranean. By the middle of the first century BC, its ambitions were expanding dramatically. And in the fourth century, Constantine, you will recall, relocated the center of the empire eastward in a city that he named after himself, Constantinople, which was to become the largest and most important city on the Mediterranean. The West had begun to look east, and the East had begun to look west. Together with increasing traffic connecting India with the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, the ancient silk roads of antiquity were coursing with life. We tend to associate the word Christendom with Western Europe, but from its origins, Christianity was a thoroughly Eastern religion. Every aspect of Christianity was Asian. Its geographic focal point, of course, was Jerusalem, together with other sites related to Jesus' birth, life, and crucifixion. Its original language is Aramaic, a member of the Semitic group of tongues native to the Near East. Its theological backdrop and the spiritual canvas was Judaism, formed in Israel and during the exile in Egypt and Babylon. Its stories were shaped by deserts, floods, droughts, and famines that were unfamiliar in Europe. We customarily associate the fall of Rome in the fifth century with the barbarian invasions in a map such as the following. A period of environmental change between the fourth and seventh centuries disrupted the lives of nomadic tribes dependent on vegetation to feed their flocks. Changes in glacial movement in the fourth century marked a shift in climate. Volcanic activity in the sixth century caused a period of colder temperatures known as the late antique Little Ice Age. The chaos created the perfect conditions for the mosaic of steppes tribes to consolidate. One tribe, the Huns, now established themselves as masters on the steppes, crushing all before them. Between about 350 and 360, there was a huge wave of migration as tribes were shunted off their lands and driven westwards. This was most likely caused by climate change, talking about a topic we've been talking about lately, which made life on the steppes exceptionally harsh and triggered intense competition for resources. A domino effect ensued as tribes displaced each other in the move westward. The impact of the rape, pillage, and anarchy that marked the fifth century as the Goths, Alans, Vandals, and Huns rampaged across Europe and North Africa is hard to exaggerate. Literacy levels plummeted. Building in stone all but disappeared, a clear sign of the collapse of wealth and ambition. Long-distance trade that once took pottery from factories in Tunisia as far as Iona in Scotland collapsed, replaced by local markets dealing only with the exchange of petty goods. The thousand-year period from roughly the 5th century to the 15th, once known as the Dark Ages, and now termed the Middle Ages, saw the economic and cultural collapse of Western Europe. But elsewhere, culture was thriving. In the early 7th century, Mohammed founded the new religion of Islam, which actively sought to unite Arab tribes in the region now known as the Middle East. A policy of respecting the so-called people of the book that is to say, Christians and Jews, helped the new religion to find acceptance. The Koran makes plain that early Muslims saw themselves not as rivals of these two faiths, but as heirs to the same legacy. Islam was spread by the sword as much as by the word. Regions under attack had the option of paying tribute and continuing in peace or facing destruction. Sharing the prizes provided a powerful incentive for joining the religion. 
In an almost perfect model of expansion, the threat of military force led to negotiated settlements as one province after another submitted to the new authorities. Enormous sums of money poured into the Muslim empire, providing for the construction of an enormous new city. It was to become the richest and most populous in the world and remained so for centuries, Baghdad. Wealthy patrons also set about funding one of the most astonishing periods of scholarship in history. Large numbers of texts were gathered and translated from Greek, Persian, and Syriac into Arabic, ranging from manuals on horse medicine and veterinary sciences to works of ancient Greek philosophy, centering in the House of Wisdom in the eighth century. I'd like to make two points. First, the contrast between the cultural impoverishment of the West during this period and the flourishing culture of the East. And second, the burgeoning trade along the Silk Road supported by the wealth of the Muslim empire. In Europe, the so-called Renaissance of the 12th century saw the foundation of the earliest universities, as well as the retransmission of classical knowledge from East to West, accompanying the Crusades. Pope Urban II promised absolution of sins for those joining the expedition to free Jerusalem from the Muslims who had held the city for centuries. But many found more materialistic rewards for their adventure. The short term offered the usual plunder and booty, but the long term offered greater remuneration in the form of trade between the East and the West. Traditional naval rivals, Venice and Genoa, lost no time in exploring the commercial potential initiated by the Crusades. The scramble between the city-states of Italy for trading dominance in the Eastern Mediterranean was frantic and ruthless, but it was not long before Venice emerged as the clear victor. By the middle of the 12th century, the Italian city-states were lucratively exploiting the enviable position that they had so brilliantly built in the East. The great works of Greek philosophy, preserved by being translated into Arabic, now found their way into Europe. It was not long either before the scientific and intellectual achievements of the Muslim world were being actively sought out and devoured by scholars in the West. Ideas from the East were taken on eagerly, if unevenly. The early 13th century in the East witnessed the transformation of individual warring Mongol tribes into a unified army under Genghis Khan, whose reputation for violence struck fear in those whom he opposed. The Mongols cultivated such fear carefully, for the reality was that Genghis Khan used violence selectively and deliberately. The sack of one city was calculated to encourage others to submit peacefully and quickly. Theatrically gruesome deaths were used to persuade other rulers that it was better to negotiate than to offer resistance. News traveled fast of the brutality that faced those who took the time to weigh up their options. Peaceful submission was rewarded. Resistance was punished brutally. The Middle Ages in Europe are traditionally seen as the time of the Crusades, chivalry, and the growing power of the papacy. But all this was little more than a sideshow to the titanic struggles taking place further east. The tribal system had led the Mongols to the brink of global domination, having conquered almost the whole continent of Asia. Europe and North Africa yawned open. It was remarkable then that the Mongol leadership focused not on the former, but on the latter. Put simply, Europe was not the best prize on offer. The battle for the medieval world was being fought between nomads from Central and Eastern Asia. As we shall see, the Mongol Empire included China. Expeditions were sent to what remained of China until it capitulated completely in the late 13th century, at which point the ruling Mongol dynasty adopted the imperial title of Yuan and founded a new city on the site of the old city of Zhangju. This now became the Mongol capital, Beijing. Just as the Pax Romana facilitated trade and travel throughout the expanse of the Roman Empire, so a Pax Mongolica fostered communication and commerce throughout Eurasia 
in the 13th and 14th centuries. The great achievement of Genghis Khan and his successors was not the ransacking of popular imagination, but the meticulous checks put in place that enabled one of the greatest empires in history to flourish for centuries to come. Instinctively, the Mongols knew how to be great empire builders. Tolerance and careful administration had to follow up on military might. The Silk Roads connecting East and West allowed the transmission of ideas and goods. Unfortunately, it also served as a conduit for the great plague that reduced the population of Europe by a third. Plagues spread rapidly in the 1340s as the outbreak moved out of the steppes through Europe, Iran, the Middle East, Egypt, and the Arabian Peninsula. Unknowingly, the Mongols had turned to biological warfare to defeat their enemy. The trading routes that connected Europe to the rest of the world now became lethal highways for the transmission of the Black Death. The death toll was enormous. Venice was all but depopulated. Accounts agree that no less than three quarters of its citizens died during the outbreak. 1492 remains one of those dates that nearly everyone remembers. The voyage of Christopher Columbus to what he thought would be India, but which turned out to be the New World. Five years later, Vasco da Gama actually did sail to India by rounding the southern tip of Africa. Europe, as Peter Frankopan notes, was no longer the terminus of the Silk Roads. It was about to become the center of the world. The world changed in the late 15th century. A series of long-range expeditions setting out from Spain and Portugal connected the Americas to Africa and Europe and ultimately to Asia for the first time. The new dawn propelled Europe to center stage. Its rise, however, brought terrible suffering in newly discovered locations. There was a price for the magnificent cathedrals, the glorious art, and the rising standards of living that blossomed from the 16th century onwards. It was paid by populations living across the oceans. Europeans were able not only to explore the world, but to dominate it. They did so thanks to relentless advances in military and naval technology that provided an unassailable advantage over the population they came in contact with. The age of empire and the rise of the West were built on the capacity to inflict violence on a major scale. The combination of diseases for which indigenous populations had no resistance and military technology to which they could not respond, guns, germs, and steel in Jared Diamond's memorable formulation, devastated the advanced civilizations of South America, including the Aztec, the Maya, and the Inca. The Spanish and Portuguese wasted no time in plundering the newly discharged, discovered lands of silver and gold. The sea lanes to Europe now became thick with heavily laden ships from the Americas. This was now a network to rival those across Asia, both in distance and scale, and soon surpassed them in value. Scarcely imaginable quantities of silver, gold, precious stones, and treasures were carried across the Atlantic. It was as if a highly tuned engine had been switched on, pumping the riches from Central and South America directly to Europe. The influx of gold and silver from the Americas to Europe quickly produced a stream flowing eastward from Europe to Asia. The most famous monument testifying to the enormous wealth that resulted from money flowing from Europe was the mausoleum built by Shah Jahan in the early 17th century for his wife Mumtaz, a building topped with a dome and a golden screen and cupolas decorated with enameled work of the highest quality and vast amounts of gold, the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal symbolizes globalized international trade that brought such wealth to the Mughal ruler that he was able to contemplate this extraordinary gesture to his beloved spouse. His ability to complete it stemmed from the profound shifts in the world's axis, for Europe and India's glory came at the expense of the Americas. Gold and silver taken from the Americas found its way to Asia. It was this redistribution of wealth that enabled the Taj Mahal to be built. 
not without irony, one of the glories of India was the result of the suffering of Indians on the other side of the world. Continents were now connected to each other, linked by flows of silver. The monopoly of the Spanish and Portuguese on transatlantic commerce did not last for long. The 17th century witnessed the golden age for the Dutch, who capitalized on their advantages, superior shipbuilding and superior cartography. By the 1640s, the Dutch had gained a major share of transatlantic shipping and controlled the sugar trade outright. Uh, a a Art, um, yeah. we just uh, we have I have a question. I mean, it's uh, back up a little bit, but you know, sure. I mean, we're all familiar with how uh, the um, uh, Euro Europeans brought disease to the, to the Americas. Um, I guess someone's asking, you know, how is it that the Mongols actually caused the plague in in Europe? So how did that transpire? Okay, what happened was that by opening up lanes of commerce that could flow very, very easily from the east to the west, the Black Death or the plague actually originated in the Far East, in China, in the Mongol territory. And so it could pass very, very easily uh, through these roads to Europe. And that was decimated the populations there. If there had been barriers, um, it might not happen so much, but everything was so wide open. It's think, think of the invasive pests that we see uh, in, in North America, for example, things that come on ships um, that were not intended, but they come along in, uh, in forms of ships. This is what happened as far as uh, commerce from the east uh, to the west. That's brought along the Black Plague. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's, I think that, uh, that answers it well. Thanks. The influence of the Silk Roads began to be felt in the arts. A thriving ceramics industry blossomed in Harlem, Amsterdam, and above all in Delft, heavily influenced by the look, feel, and design of items imported from the East. Take a look at these Chinese decorations, and yet we associate this with uh, Holland. Chinese visual themes dominated while the characteristic blue and white wares developed centuries earlier by potters in the Persian Gulf, which had become popular in China and in the Ottoman Empire, were adopted so widely they became distinctive features of Dutch ceramics as well. With demand increasing for objects that helped to show status, the arts in general in the Netherlands flourished. In the 20th century, the attention of Western nations focused once again on the East, this time as the primary source of a now indispensable substance, oil. The British were the first to establish a claim on black gold by forming the Anglo-Persian Oil Company in 1908, which eventually became British Petroleum. That the terms of the agreement handed control of Persia's crown jewels to foreign investors led to a deep and festering hatred of the outside world which in turn led to nationalism and ultimately to a more profound suspicion and rejection of the West, best epitomized in modern Islamic fundamentalism. The desire to win control of oil will be the cause of many problems in the future. The Americans soon followed with incursions by Standard Oil. The story had familiar echoes of the discovery of the Americas 400 years earlier. While local populations had not been decimated to the same way as those encountered by the Spanish, the process was effectively the same. The expropriation of treasures by nations of the West meant that the riches flowed out of one continent to another with minimal benefit to the inhabitants of those lands. This time it was not spices or silks, slaves or silver that traversed the globe, but oil. The need for oil shaped American foreign policy leading the U.S. to support regimes whose values directly contradicted those associated with everything America traditionally stood for. The effects of these decisions continue to be felt to the present day. Unlike the Aztecs, the Inca, or the Maya, the oil-producing nations of the Middle East, once they discovered the power of consolidation, gained leverage by controlling the supply of oil. The creation of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, in 1960, was designed to coordinate the release of oil supplies on the 
open market. OPEC effectively marked a deliberate attempt to curtail the influence of the West, whose interest in providing cheap and plentiful fuel for its domestic markets were distinctly different from those of the countries that were rich in deposits of oil and gas and who were keen for the revenues they brought in to be as high as possible. The effect of the oil hungry economies of the developed world was disastrous as inflation threatened to gallop out of control. Peter Frankopan observes that the world's center of gravity is now returning to the east. From east to west, the Silk Roads are rising once more. What we are witnessing are the birthing pains of a region that once dominated the intellectual, cultural, and economic landscape and which is now re-emerging. We are seeing the signs of the world's center of gravity shifting back to where it lay for millennia. This is a region being revived and restored to former glory. A new Chinese network is in the process of being built that extends across the globe. The age of the West is at a crossroads, if not at an end. The Silk Roads are rising again. Part two, Marco Polo and Kublai Khan. Having reevaluated the importance of Eastern trade networks throughout history, and having reoriented our worldview from Western Europe to Asia, let us return to the 13th century and the adventures of Marco Polo. As traders, the Polo family belonged to a community that dominated life in Venice. In Venice, travel was not the exception, it was the norm. Everyone in Venice, it seemed, was a traveler and a merchant, or aspired to be. The growth and commerce among European city-states contributed to rapid advances in art, technology, exploration, and finance. Just about everybody in Venice engaged in commerce. Fortunes were made and lost overnight, and Venetian family fortunes were built on the success of a single trade expedition to Constantinople. The influx of products from east to west in the 12th and 13th century was particularly marked in Venice, which rightly regarded itself as the commercial capital of the world. Marco Polo's father, Niccolo, and his brother, Maffeo, were united in a fraterna compagnia, a family partnership. Merchants, they were born in that period when Venetian trade was expanding at a rate which is never to be equaled. These were the years which were to culminate in the first minting of the Venetian gold ducat, the international currency of the Middle Ages. In 1253, the brothers undertook a trading expedition to the east possibly unaware of the pregnancy that would bring Marco to the world in 1254. Ironically, the terrifying Mongols, by bringing diverse warring tribes under their control, created an era of peace in which travelers could move confidently. As a direct consequence of Mongol tyranny, the Silk Road became safe for commerce, so safe that one traveler claimed that a young woman would have been able to travel with a golden tray on her head without fear. And it was safe enough for merchants like the Polos to travel its great length into the heart of Asia and the Mongol Empire. After several years of travel and delay, the Polo brothers were able to meet the great Khan, who decided to make them his ambassadors to the Pope. But he had two requests that the Pope sent him 100 men of learning in Christian doctrine, and that they bring back some oil from the lamp that burns at the sepulcher of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. In return, he would give them the Peza, a royal Mongol passport, guaranteeing their safe passage. Plans fell apart when the Folo brothers learned that Pope Clement IV had died in 1268, they waited in Venice for a new pope to be elected. More than 16 years had passed since Niccolo and Maffeo Polo had last seen their home. Niccolo learned that his wife was dead, perhaps even more startling, she had left him a small son of 15 years who had the name Marco. For two years, Niccolo and Maffeo languished in Venice, waiting news of the next pope's identity. Niccolo remarried and his new wife became pregnant. A pope, Gregory X, was elected only in 1271 after the longest meeting of the Card College of Cardinals in history. 
In place of the requested 100 Christian scholars, he sent only two, but the Polos, presumably after a fair amount of negotiating, did manage to obtain the required oil from the lamp of the sepulcher of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. The Polos, consummate traders, encountered an unusual practice among the pearl traders of Tabriz in what is now Azerbaijan. Tabriz served as an important pearl market, perhaps the largest of all, supplied by abundant harvests from the Persian Gulf. The Polo Company found that bargaining for pearls in the Tabriz market was a serious matter governed by firm rules. A buyer and seller squatted facing each other It looked like the bystanders had no indication of the actual terms of the deal, and the price remained flexible from one transaction to another. Meanwhile, the Pax Mongola, Mongolica rendered the journey of the Mongol capital relatively safe. The geography, on the other hand, presented substantial challenges to any traveler. For transportation, the Polo, Polo Company relied on the Bactrian camel, which had served travelers along the Silk Road since biblical times. Unlike the sil single helped dromedary common in North Africa, the Bactrian camel has two lopsided humps to store fat, a long neck, minimal ears, and massive teeth, some of them pointed. The animals come in as many colors as the desert itself, from dirty white to deep gritty brown. Camels are suited to desert crossings. Their broad cloven hoofs resist sinking into loose sand. Their large nostrils are lined with hairs and can, can close like valves to prevent the inhalation of flying sand. After several days of strenuous travel atop their camels, the exhausted and thirsty travelers reach their first oasis, Sopragon. Marco's bout of tuberculosis delayed the company for the better part of a year as the young man had to recover first from tuberculosis and then from the opium addiction produced by its treatment. Eventually, the party continued east, crossing what Marco describes as the highest point in the world. Marco did not exaggerate. His party was ascending the Terak Pass through the Pamir, the traditional dividing line between east and west, heading toward the farthest and wildest western border of China. Simply breathing, posed a great hardship for wayfarers. They were traversing a region that came to be known as the roof of the world, 14,000 feet above sea levels, surrounded by the highest mountain peaks on earth, Mount Everest among them. The sheer extent of these mountain ranges and the thought of crossing them on foot beggars the imagination. Then came the Russian steppe, heading east, the Polo Company faced more than 4,000 miles of grassy plains interrupted by occasional mountain ranges. This terrain was known by its Russian name, the Steppe, and was divided into two parts. The Western Steppe extended from the Danube River to the Altai mountain range around Siberia, Siberia, often described as a sea of grass. It was an area through which rivers and streams flowed freely. The Eastern Steppe, extending into Mongolia, was drier and harsher. Grass for grazing was far more sparse. Free flowing streams yielded to infrequent oases. Negotiating the rigors of the Eastern Steppe required endurance and indifference to the elements for those who dared into its expanse. Throughout his travels, Marco struggles to find words to convey the sheer scale of the terrain he encounters to his eventual Venetian readers. The desert of Lop, he writes, is so huge that it would take a month to ride across its narrowest stretch. Marco's stark characterization of the desert of Lop was entirely accurate. At times, the windstorms that the Polos encountered became so powerful that they swept the desert bare of sand with wind-borne granules blasting rocks below and carving furrows as deep as 20 feet creating a series of undulating dunes hypnotic to the traveler. 
In this moonscape, daily temperatures fluctuated wildly. Marco endured highs of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit by day and some freezing temperatures at night. The Polos finally reached the Mongolian capital, where they delivered the requested oil to Kublai Khan, the two Christian scholars having long since deserted their company. In his account, Margot idealizes the great Khan, minimizing the violence that had brought him to his position of authority. Overwhelmed by this august personage, Marco portrays him in exalted terms. He says, the title Khan means great Lord of Lords, and certainly he has a right to this title, for everyone should know that this great Khan is the mightiest man, whether in respect of subjects or territory or treasure, who is in the world today, Marco later said without exaggeration. The capital city of Kambulak, now Beijing, challenged Marco Polo to capture in words its vast scale, so different from the cramped quarters of Venice. The palace is square in every way, says Marco. First, there is a square circuit of wall, and each face is eight miles long, round which there is a deep moat, and in the middle of each side is a gate by which all the people enter who gathered here from every side. Then there is a space of a mile all around. There the soldiers are stationed. After that, space is found for another circuit of all, six miles on a side. The scale of this city and its walls were enough to make Marco's European audience gasp with astonishment. Instead of the quaint capital they might have imagined, a giant fortress rose as testimony to the strength of the Mongol Empire. The Polos occupied a peculiar position as both guests and prisoners of the Great Khan. To survive in this strange land, Marco would have to find a way to make himself useful to the Khan. Kublai Khan sent him on the road to collect taxes and, more important, gather information about the realm, so much of which remained unexplored. Within the confines of the empire, Marco's occupation would bear an eerie similarity to his career before he met Kublai Khan, traveler. But now Marco had a purpose of his own. Winning Kublai Khan's approval marked the decisive moment in young Marco's life. Henceforth, he stepped out of his elder's shadow and emerged. Marco Polo and Kublai Khan participated in a most unusual partnership as master and servant, teacher and disciple, and even father and son. Marco displayed an unexpected facility for conjuring distant, obscure worlds, making them seem both marvelous and comprehensible to his audience. Kublai was his first assignment editor, his first and most important audience, and ultimately his most compelling subject. Marco's first assignment was to Qinsai, now called Hangzhou, the wealthiest city in China and the largest city in the world with a population of one and a half million compared with 60,000 for Venice. Much of his journey took place by way of the Grand Canal running a thousand miles between the two cities. Now I live in Fort Myers. It's a thousand miles from Fort Myers to New York. You can sail between those two cities on the inland waterway, but that was built by the Army Corps of Engineers by using modern, modern machinery. Imagine digging a thousand mile canal by hand. King Tsai, like Venice, grew around a series of canals. Hangzhou, captivated Marco as did no other place in Asia. For the first time, he encountered the grandeur of China at its most advanced, unspoiled by the Mongols. Marco strained credulity with his description of Kinsai's sprawl, although it was entirely accurate. There are 10 principal open spaces, besides infinite others for the districts, which are square, that is, half a mile for a side, he writes. And along the front street of those, there is a main street 40 paces wide, which runs straight from one end of the city to the other, with many bridges that cross it level and conveniently. And every four miles is found one of those squares, such as have two miles as a set of circuit. Marco was particularly impressed by the West Lake, nine miles in circumference and only nine feet deep. The lake served as a focal point for the city, the quintessential Chinese landscape and the inspiration for countless works of art. Venice celebrated carnival 
just before Lent, but Tikin Sai seemed to Marco to be a city of perpetual carnival. A Chinese record of the era lists 554 performers who appeared at court grouped into 55 categories, including kite flyers and ball players, magicians and singers, impressionists, archers, and body raconteurs. The concept of recreation for the masses was as new to Marco as it would have been to his readers, and he portrays an entire city in the thrall of pleasure. With distance came perspective. When Marco was in Kambulak, Kublai Khan seemed like a brilliant sun outshining all sources of light. But the farther the Venetian ventured to the fringes of the Mongol Empire in performances of his duties as tax collector, and the more instances of Mongol violence, including the slaughter of women and children, he witnessed or heard about, the more disillusioned he became. At one time, the Mongols had appeared more sympathetic to Marco than their enemies, but as he observed them brutally enforcing their empire's rule, having himself sampled the refinement of China, a long, slow disillusionment with the Mongols quietly set in. That disillusionment informed his narrative, even as he struggled to maintain his allegiance to the warriors of the slope. Much as Marco enjoyed his career as professional traveler, he, his father, and his uncle had real concerns for their future as Kublai Khan's health declined. Should he die before they effected their return home, the golden pesa that he had given them would be worthless in securing safe passage. Niccolo begged to return to his wife. Kublai Khan considered this carefully worded appeal. On no condition in the world am I willing that you depart from my realm, he answered. But I am well content that you go about it wherever you please. In other words, they were offered complete freedom within an enormous prison. Finally, an opportunity arose. Kublai Khan intended to present the 17-year-old Mongol princess Kokakan to be the wife of Argon, the king of Persia. Marco Polo claimed some experience as a sailor, and the great Khan agreed to let the three Polos accompany the young woman on her long voyage. Another problem arose. By the time they reached Persia, Argon was dead, possibly poisoned by his enemies. So instead, Kokakin was presented as the wife to Argon's son, Kassan. The young princess did not wish to leave, be left alone in this strange and threatening land. Because she was a princess, her wish was law. So the three Venetians stayed for an additional nine months. They came at last to Venice in 1295. After 24 years of adventure, narrow escapes, trading in exotic lands, and high-level diplomatic missions, the Polo Company's expedition through Asia, India, and Africa had come to an end. But Marco Polo's adventures contained one last chapter. Three years after his return to Venice, he was commanding a ship in a naval battle against the city's arch-rival, Genoa. When Genoa won the battle, Marco was imprisoned for the better part of a year. Fortunately for history, he discovered among his fellow prisoners one Rusticello of Pisa, a writer of chivalric romances who served as a kind of ghostwriter for Marco's book of travels. Some early readers of the book wondered whether Marco had actually been to China. Why has he never mentioned the Great Wall? But much of it had fallen down by the 13th century. Almost everything that the tourists had normally known today was built in the 16th century. The significance of the inventions that he brought back from China, or which he later described in his travels, cannot be overstated. At first, Europeans regarded these technological marvels with disbelief, but eventually they adopted them. Paper money, virtually unknown in the West until Marco's return, revolutionized finance and commerce throughout the West. Coal, another item that had caught Marco's attention in China, provided a new and relatively efficient source of heat to an energy-starved Europe. Eyeglasses became accepted as a remedy for failing eyesight. In addition, lenses gave rise to the telescope and the microscope. Gunpowder, which the Chinese had employed for at least three centuries, revolutionized European warfare as armies exchanged their lances, swords, and crossbows for cannon, portable harquebuses, and pistols. In all, it is difficult to imagine 
the Renaissance, or for that matter, the modern world, without the benefit of Marco Polo's example of cultural transmission between East and West. Part three, the great divergence. A comparison between China and Western Europe in the early part of the 15th century presents a striking contrast. In China, yeah. Yeah, 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 just um, a quick, uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit. Uh, so, uh, you know, how much territory did the, did the Mongols control? And, you know, with these advances that um, Marco Polo described, what, how much of that was um, uh, developed during the Mongol um, control and how much was, you know, the... the base it was the Chinese who had developed it. The, the Mongols took over China as well as practically all of Asia. The Mongols didn't have any great uh, inventive powers, but China did. Uh, and they had controlled China. And so these are Chinese inventions. Okay, so it was a very prosperous... Um, uh, you know, continent, I guess, if you can call it that, before the Mongols um, created a system of travel and so forth. Oh, yeah, yeah. They just took over China and then took on a name for uh, for one of their dynasties. Uh, but no, it's the Chinese that developed all this. It was a very advanced civilization in 1500, much, much more advanced than Europe. And the Mongols just took it over. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to try to uh, more fully understand the distinction between... Uh, the, the, the Chinese culture that had been there and, and then the, the Mongols and what they added to it. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, let's go on to this next slide. A comparison between China and Western Europe in the early part of the 15th century presents a striking contrast. Chinese nautical technology led the world during this period China's big compartmentalized ships with as many as four decks, four or six masts, and a dozen sails, which were guided by a stern post rudder and the use of charts and the compass, could carry 500 men. This technology was far ahead of West Asia and Europe, where Midi Mediterranean galleys were still using muscle power and an inefficient steering oar. Any modern-minded expansionist looking back on all this growth and creativity can imagine how Song China left to itself could have taken over the maritime world and reversed history by invading and colonizing Europe from Asia. Seemingly the only thing lacking was motivation and incentives. Historian Niall Ferguson describes the contrast this way. The treasure ship of Admiral Zheng Ha, the most famous sailor in Chinese history, was 400 feet long nearly five times the size of the Santa Maria in which Christopher Columbus crossed the Atlantic in 1492, you can compare the relative sizes of the Santa Maria and the treasure ship in our sketch. And this was only part of a fleet of more than 300 ocean-going junks. With a combined crew of 28,000, Zheng Ha's navy was bigger than anything seen in the West until First World War. But in 1424, when Yangle died, Chinese overseas ambitions were buried with him. Zheng Ha's voyages were immediately suspended. The Hajin decree definitely banned oceanic voyages. It's hard to imagine this, but everything was shut down because the centralized control in China was so great that when the emperor decreed no more ex uh, uh, um, exploration, that was it, no more explanation. We commonly associate civilization with cities. In 1500, as far as we can work out, the biggest city in the world was Beijing with a population of between 600,000 and 700,000. London had perhaps 50,000 inhabitants. London in the early 15th century was just recovering from the Black Death. Besides the plague, typhus, dysentery, and smallpox were also rife. And even in the absence of epidemics, poor sanitation made London a death trap. Without any kind of sewage system, the streets stank to high heaven, whereas human excrement was systematically collected in Chinese cities and used as fertilizer in outlying paddy fields. 
By 1420, when the Forbidden City was completed, Ming China had an incontrovertible claim to be the most advanced civilization in the world. China's technological achievements preceded those in Europe, often by centuries. Long before the Ming era, Chinese civilization had consistently sought to master the world through technological innovation. In 1086, Su Song added a gear escapement to create the world's first mechanical clock, an intricate 40-foot tall contraption that not only told the time, but also charted the movements of the sun, moon, and planets. The printing press with movable type is traditionally credited to 15th century Germany. In reality, it was invented in 11th century China. Paper too originated in China long before it was introduced in the West. So did paper money, wallpaper, and toilet paper. Beginning in the late 15th century, Western Europe began a development that over 500 years led to its domination of the world whereas China fell behind. How can one explain this great divergence between the two civilizations? Now Ferguson finds the answer in the form of six killer apps, competition, science, property, medicine, consumption, and work. The end of the 15th century saw the beginning of a new age of exploration that changed the map of the world by adding two continents not formally known to exist. Even the earliest voyages of discovery were motivated by a desire for material gain. Columbus hoped to find a direct sea route to India that might shorten the length of time required for the transportation of goods from there back to Europe. He, of course, failed in this effort, but the discovery of gold and silver in the Americas more than compensated for any disappointment. A general competition for this new source of wealth ensued with Spain and Portugal leaving the pack. The intermediate warfare among European states had several immediate consequences, beginning with the continual need to improve military technology to gain an edge over one's adversary. Constant warfare also prevented any individual monarch from ever gaining enough power to unilaterally decree an end to navigation as the emperor of China had done. Both military campaigns and voyages of exploration required substantial financial backing and the European rulers became more efficient at raising revenues in support of their ventures. By comparison with the patchwork quilt of Europe, East Asia was in political terms at least a vast monochrome blanket. In the ninth century, the Persian empire led the world in scientific knowledge the first truly experimental science was Muslim. Al-Haytham, whose seven work volume Book of Optics overthrew a host of ancient misconceptions, notably the idea that we're able to see objects because our eyes emit light. The world owes a debt to the medieval Muslim world for both its custodianship of classical wisdom and its generation of new knowledge in cartography, medicine, and philosophy, as well as in mathematics and optics. But the so-called scientific revolution, beginning with the publication of Copernicus's On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres in 1543, centered almost entirely in Europe. Why did the Muslim world fall so far behind? We observe in the case of China that a single decision by an all-powerful monarch could effectively end exploratory navigation. A similar phenomenon may be seen in the Arab world, where the unlimited reach of religion had a negative effect on scientific development. Under clerical influence, the study of ancient philosophy was curtailed. Printing, too, was resisted in the Muslim world. This failure to reconcile Islam with scientific progress was to prove disastrous. Having once provided European scholars with ideas and inspiration, Muslim scientists were now cut off from the latest research. Two English philosophers of the 17th century, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, held strongly divergent views on government. Hobbes held that controlling human beings' baser instincts required an all-powerful sovereign, a leviathan, in Hobbes' words. 
Locke, by contrast, believed that the purpose of government was to protect individual rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. That last word may catch you by surprise. So accustomed are we to the Jeffersonian formulation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But the control of property proved to be the critical issue in the 17th century and thereafter. Now Ferguson describes the settlement of North and South America as a kind of grand experiment testing two alternative political philosophies. The key question that faced the new settlers in the Americas, Spaniards in the South, Britons in the North, was how to allocate all this new land. Their answers to this question would ultimately determine the future leadership of Western civilization. They could scarcely have been more different. In the Spanish Hobbesian model, power over the distribution of property remained centralized. The king might delegate a development of certain property, but control rested with the monarch, a pattern that continues to influence the countries of South America to this day. The British Lockean model, as it played out in North America, offered every individual the possibility of individual ownership of property, a drama played out not only in the early settlements, but flamboyantly in the Oklahoma land rush of 1893. Both North and South America enjoyed abundant natural resources. The outcome of the experiment depended largely on the difference in two political systems. North America was better off than South America purely and simply because the British model of widely distributed private property rights and democracy worked better than the Spanish model of concentrated wealth and authoritarianism. In both North and South American, European civilization exposed indigenous peoples to diseases for which they had no immunity with an effect even more devastating than that wrought by superior military technology. In the European colonization of Africa, the tables were turned. Malaria, cholera, yellow fever, and other diseases made exploration of the continent so hazardous that West Africa became known as the white man's graveyard. The challenge of these African diseases proved to be the impetus for a great expansion of medical research. It turns out that Africa's uniquely life-threatening repertoire of tropical diseases elicited sustained effort on the part of the West scientists and health officials that would not have been forthcoming in the absence of imperialism. The scramble for Africa has become a byword for the ruthless carving up of an entire continent by rapacious Europeans. The scramble for Africa was also a scramble for scientific knowledge, which was as collaborative as it was competitive, and which had undoubted benefits for the natives as well as the Europeans. The bacteriologist, often risking his life to find cures for lethal afflictions, was another kind of imperial hero, as brave in his way as a soldier explorer. The Industrial Revolution propelled a dramatic increase in the production of consumer goods, yet production in itself would have been pointless without a corresponding increase in the demand for the goods being produced. If technological innovation spurred the supply side, the demand side of the Industrial Revolution was driven by the seemingly insatiable appetite human beings have for clothes. The incorporation of vast numbers of young men into the military during the Second World War had an enormous influence on the clothing industry. Before the war, most clothes were made to measure by tailors, but the need to manufacture tens of millions of military uniforms encouraged the development of standard sizes. Standardized sizes allowed civilian clothes, as well as uniforms, to be mass produced and sold off the peg or ready to wear. In the post-war United States, the consumer society became a phenomenon of the masses, significantly diminishing the sartorial differences between the social classes. The phenomenon of the consumer society in the decades following the Second World War makes it difficult to make historical comparisons of standards of living. Consider the quality of life of the wealthiest aristocrat in any period before the 20th century, lacking washing machine, air conditioning, clothes dryer, dishwasher, and color television. By 1989, when the Cold War effectively ended, two-thirds or more of all Americans had all these things, with the exception of the dishwasher. 
They also had acquired microwave ovens and video cassette recorders. By the end of the millennium, personal computers and cell phones were in half of all homes, as was the internet. The phrase Protestant work ethic has become a cliche, but one with a fair amount of truth behind it. The generations after the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century saw a shift of economic power away from the Catholic countries like Austria, France, Italy, Portugal, and Spain, and toward Protestant countries like England, Holland, Prussia, Saxony, and Scotland. It seemed as if forms of faith and ways of worship were in some way correlated with people's economic fortunes. The qualities of thrift and industry led to material rewards as well as religious approval. For most of history, man had worked to live, but the Protestants lived to work. Recent surveys of attitude show that Protestants have unusually high levels of mutual trust, an important precondition for the development of efficient credit networks. This tends to mean not only hard work and mutual trust, but also thrift, honesty, and openness to strangers, all economically beneficial traits. Protestantism made the West not only work, but also save and read. Conclusion, the great convergence. Six killer apps helped to explain the relative reversal in positions between the East and the West during the half a millennium ending in the 20th century. These same applications may assist us in describing the developments in the 21st century, competition, science, property, medicine, consumption, and work. The five largest tech companies, Apple, Facebook, Alphabet, that is Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, are collectively worth more than the entire economy of the United Kingdom. To look at it from another perspective, Apple makes roughly as much money every day as 2,500 average U.S. households make in a year. The rise of monopolies tends to stifle innovation and inhibit progress. The United States continues to dominate scientific research, but U.S. kids do worse on math and science tests than other countries. American universities also graduate a smaller portion of science majors. And currently nine countries spend a larger proportion of their GNP on research than the US, including Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Japan, South Korea, and Israel. The American dream of home ownership turned to a nightmare in the 2008 subprime mortgage crash. Even getting out of one's parents' basement seems to be an ambition beyond realization for many. The United States spends more per capita than any other country in the world on medicine. Yet the influence of the drug industry that concealed the truth about opioid drugs from the physicians who prescribed them contributed to a national drug crisis. The United States consistently rates last in any comparison of healthcare among the dozen largest developed nations. Consumption continues apace in the Western world, far outstripping the ability to pay for what's been consumed. Recent credit card debt exceeded $1 trillion in the United States for the first time. The average American currently has a credit card balance of $6,375. That is, say, $6,375. The ideals of thrift and frugality seem utterly old-fashioned in the United States. By comparison, on average, Chinese households save more than a fifth of the money they make. Corporations save even more in the form of retained earnings. In 2007, the 14th Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party was presented with a report specifying three requirements for sustainable economic growth. Property rights as a foundation, the law as a safeguard, and morality as a support. As we've seen, these used to be among the key foundations of Western civilization. Yet in recent years, we in the West have seemed to lose our faith in them. All we risk we being left with our vacuous consumer society and a culture of relativism, a culture that says any theory or opinion, no matter how outlandish, is just as good as whatever it was we used to believe in. The great divergence manifests itself in various ways. In 1500, the world's 10 largest cities had nearly all been in the East, with Beijing by far the largest, more than 10 times the size of wretched little London. In 1900, the biggest cities were nearly all in the West, 
with London more than four times the size of Tokyo, uh, Asia's largest conurbation. Now Ferguson observes a new shift in the world's center of gravity from the west back to the east. In some ways, the Asian century has already arrived. China is on the brink of surpassing the American share of global manufacturing, having, over, having overtaken Germany and Japan since the new century began. China's biggest city, Shanghai, is already far larger than any American city and sits aside a new league table of non-Western megacities. In sheer numbers, of course, Asia has long been the world's most populous region, but the rapid growth of Africa's population makes the decline of the West a near certainty. The financial crisis that began in the summer of 2007 should be understood as an accelerator of an already well-established trend of relative Western decline. The silk roads that led Marco Polo to Xanadu may be compared with air traffic patterns that increasingly tilt toward the east. National Geographic lists the 10 busiest airports in the world in terms of annual passenger traffic. Atlanta, Beijing, Dubai, Los Angeles, Tokyo, Chicago, London, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Paris. I hope that this brief look as several thousand years of world history has broadened your geographic perspective. As we gain a new appreciation of the East, networks and connections are quietly being knitted together across the spine of Asia, or rather, they are being restored. I thank you. Art, uh, that was uh, fantastic, covered a lot of ground, brought up to the current day. There's a lot to chew on. Um, I think we, we do have a few questions coming coming in, but before we um, do kind of a, a, a Q&A session, I'm going to, I just wanna let people know what current events are coming up in terms of this lecture series. So let me uh, share my screen and, Okay, I think that's up now, yeah. So um, so our next uh, presentation is Monday, August 22nd. Again, uh, as always, from three o'clock to 4.30 p.m. And we will have uh, Carl Van Newkirk, uh, who is a popular Encore learning instructor. He will enlighten us on the indigenous people of America with a focus on those who inhabited our local region. And uh, Carl Van Nuker is uh, uh, somewhat of a local uh, historian. I think that will be uh, very informative and, and interesting. So please join us in a couple of weeks. For Side, uh, what you may be interested in. There's always a lot of a lot of great choices. We have both in person and virtual classes being offered here in the fall, and and then uh, uh, a few days following the preview on Tuesday, September sixth, beginning at ten o'clock sharp is when you can get online and do your online enrollment to some of the popular classes. Um, you do need to get in there right away in order to reserve your spot, and um, you can uh, um, you go if you're not you know if you're listening to this you're not a member I encourage you to become a member you need to be a member to take classes you can go to www.encorelearning.net and uh, both to sign in for the preview which uh, you can do as a non-member and then uh, you can uh, go use a website to to become a member so that's uh, just let people know that okay so um, let me. Uh, uh, stop sharing and go to the questions. So um, Martin uh, wants to know, uh, he says, I understand why Western society made advances um, uh, in, you know, in the past, uh, but uh, the key question here should be, why didn't Eastern society do the same? So what was different during the period where the Western culture was you know, advancing scientifically, militarily, uh, uh, economically? So. If you want to tackle that, go ahead. Well, it's um, 
basically the way I suggested that in the Western part of the world, the competition for in every respect um, led to all kinds of advancement uh, in navigation and various other things. Um, what happened in the East in two important areas, uh, when the Chinese simply stopped navigation, you saw the size of that treasure ship compared with the tiny Santa Maria. It was an enormous ship. They had 300 of these. There's no reason why they couldn't have taken over uh, exploration of Europe and all the rest. And yet they didn't. And that's because of the total power concentrated in a single person whose decision was no more navigation. Well, that ended it. And the same thing happened with regard to um, the religious control uh, in, uh, in Islam. The huge advances in science, the gathering of philosophy, all this, they said no more. And it stopped. Uh, and um, and this, is, this had a huge impact uh, on, on just meaning that the, that, uh, the East did not uh, carry forward in ways that it could have uh, that what the West did. Yeah, so uh, obviously uh, the command and control centralization in this case uh, hurt them. And, you know, it's interesting now, I've heard some people say that uh, in some ways that's helping China when they need to turn on a dime uh, in different ways. I mean, even conservative uh, um, economists uh, who, you know, are very uh, laissez-faire. So it's kind of interesting that way. But but here's kind of a, a, in that vein, a question that says uh, from Steve says, please discuss the comparative aspect of innovation and invention amongst Asia and West, especially the US. I think he's talking current, current times. Uh, isn't this aspect in the information age a counterpoint to saying the East is rising and the West is is de is declining? So I think you mentioned those companies in the US that uh, have been uh, so successful, although there's a number in, in uh, Asia, Alibaba and uh, Tencent and um, JD. Uh, so I, I don't know, what are your thoughts uh, in terms of where things are going from a te technological standpoint? Is someone winning, winning at uh, uh, the race there? When you've got complete centralized control, which is what we're talking about in China, um, if you make the wrong decision, it can be absolutely disastrous as historically we would look upon the decision not to do any more navigation. But if you make the right decision, um, you don't have to worry about any competition, you don't have to worry about um, Congress passing legislation or not passing legislation. You don't have to worry about interest groups. You simply make a decision and it's done. Um, and so it's got huge advantages if you make the right decision. And the, as far as investing in innovation in scientific research, if you make that decision at a central level and don't worry about people objecting to that, you can achieve huge amounts. And that's what the Chinese have done. And clearly um, there's a great movement in every respect that we measure these things toward the East at this point. I was just showing cities and airports, but you could use dozens of other indicators to show what's happening in the world. The United States is, is um, used to be um, having huge amounts of government uh, invest, investment in research and, and development, which individual companies can't afford to do. But lately, the um, U.S. government has stopped doing that, and it's having its real cost. Yeah, that's interesting. Of course, we just had Congress pass, uh, I don't know what they call it. There the you bill, go, the but, chip bill. Chip bill, yeah, thank you, the chip bill. So maybe they're uh, stepping back in uh, to that role. And, and, and obviously, they're incentivizing uh, clean energy, so maybe they do realize that there does need to be uh, a role for 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 government in uh, um, incentivizing technological advances. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of interesting to compare uh, the East and West at the current time. So um, here's a question. So going back to when Marco Polo uh, was um, over a Mongol uh, uh, Empire with uh, Kublai Khan. So how did he uh, how did he communicate um, and and get around? I mean, I, you know. Well, both within the, the empire, but also, I guess, with the uh, Kublai Khan. What was the communication uh, opportunities? Yeah, that's a very language? good question. It's never mentioned in any of the books about him. I presume that he must have, um, I'm guessing, he, I'm not guessing that he probably learned Chinese. I think he probably just carried an interpreter around with him. 
I, that would I translated that would make more most sense. But he traveled all over the kingdom, and Kublai Khan who was just sitting in his palace. I mean, China was enormous. Um, the differences uh, geographically in China, unless you've really studied it, it's hard to imagine that that much um, diversity could exist in one realm. But Kublai Khan didn't have any idea, and. Marco Polo was his reporter. He didn't know who he could trust, but he was this guy going all over the kingdom and reporting back. And Kublai Khan was fascinated by this. And remember, 16 years is what they spent uh, doing this, uh, acting as reporter for Kublai Khan. But I'm, he must have had a translator. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay. So yeah, so obviously we're here, we're using Marco Polo's writings to uh, help us understand uh, what was going on at that time uh, in in the East? Uh, do what is there other sources, or or is Marco Polo literally the best source for what was going on in the East at that time? He had a unique situation in which he was really investigating all of China, and not only China. He traveled to India, to Africa, all under um, this authority that he had from uh, from Kublai Khan. Um, there was nobody who had that kind of experience. Um, in China, in any case, uh, there were other people that traveled, obviously, but he had a really unique insight. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. That that still remains uh, one of the best sources. And now here's a question that uh, you know you 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 touched on uh, the religious aspect and how uh, well, I think you said Calvinism was uh, one of the uh, and the 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 the, the, the um, um, Protestant work ethic. Yeah, the work ethic was a was a big plus for the for the West. Now, this is a question from uh, Steve about um, uh, was controlled by religious leaders and their theology a factor in the decline of the Far East, such as China, Japan, um, and, and he also mentions uh, is Islam being predominant. Although I'm not sure, uh, in, in that's true in the main land of China and Japan. But so maybe you just comment in general on the role of how the role of religion has played in, in the East over the years as it pertains to their development. The Islamic fundamentalism um, has tended to preserve what we would consider a medieval <laughs> set, of, set of values. The treatment of women is one, something that people in the West find appalling, but not just that, um, just the refusal to investigate, to use science, uh, just to stuck, be stuck back in a medieval way of doing things, um, that has had a negative effect on, on that way of, uh, on the development of, of real thought. Well, well, I mean, we also, you also mentioned that Islam um, was far ahead scientific, scientifically, uh, the Islamic nations at one time. So yeah. was there something that shifted or changed in terms yes, there of was. religious? Um, there, in fact, I have another lecture that I gave on uh, on Islam and just the, uh, the, the high point of the Arabic culture. Um, then when um, the Islamic rulers decided that they no longer wanted to have science, they no longer wanted to have um, study of uh, Western treatises, it just, it was a shutdown of of uh, intellectual thought, it was just astonishing you could do that, but that's what happened. Yeah, but but also, so um, mainland China though was was not. I mean, how much of mainland what we what is now mainland mainland China was uh, Islamic? I mean, I thought not, not at all. Was, that's not that's not an issue. Uh, okay, so that they were they were what mainly Confucianism or yeah, um, I don't know what happened to the uh, because. We talked about the huge number of technical developments in China, uh, but for some reason that simply wasn't wasn't pursued. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's a question about. Um, well, so now we're on the topic of religion and its effect on uh, society and uh, economies. I mean, I don't know if you want to step into this one about, but uh, Christian Christian nationalism, I guess, is something that uh, there's a lot of discussion about in in the in the U.S. Maybe in the West in general. Um, is is that going to have? A, I don't think that has a main effect. That's not a, a real issue on scientific development at this point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, so similar question: Christian fundamentalism is it having a similar effect uh, on intellectual thought in the U.S.? I, I, it's a similar question 
Uh, just um, no, it doesn't. It's not. Uh, it's. I don't think it's a real uh, influence. Okay. Um, I uh, also you mentioned that uh, the U.S. Uh, I think you did the performance in the schools. School performance is uh, uh, lagging. A lot of the I know Western industrial nations. I, I guess the Eastern as well. But I, I, is it? I would love to hear a little bit more about your. There's your a lot less emphasis on science and mathematics in American schools as compared with um, its competitors, both in Europe and in Asia. Um, and it's really unfortunate. I was I taught mathematics for a while, uh, particularly in a school, a school that had 30% uh, Asian uh, population. And we talk about, in the West, we have the idea that there's no point in going to math unless you're good at math. That's a, a fairly um, prevalent notion in the United States. That's not a notion in, in Asia. Quite the contrary. Anybody is expected to do well in mathematics. Why would you not? Um, I tried to put it this way. Suppose that you thought that there's no point in studying English unless you were good in English. Um, people would laugh at that. And that's not, everybody takes English, obviously. But that's, that's the attitude toward mathematics that we don't have um, in the United States right now that is the case in our Asian competitors. And they're far ahead by not having that hang up that you have to be good in math to take math. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's a very good point. There's a kind of a cultural cultural dif difference, um, and I, you know, I I, th I think uh, well, let's see, we've got one more question coming. In. Um, uh, so, Steve uh, asked, "Does uh, do you have a theory of why science and technology did not continue to advance in the Far East?" Um, uh, you know, when it got to the great divergence uh, I guess but you know whether that that was by edict or or there were there other uh, forces uh, beyond just the centralization I just don't know yeah I just don't know but clearly um, there's no such uh, resistance now right 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 um and then um, but here from Richard he mentioned that individual uh, initiative and creativity is actually incentivized in the Western uh, Western culture. Um, that's, I suppose, why we have some of the, you know, Apples and Microsofts. Um, do, is there is there similar um, incentives in the East for initiative and creativity, or is it different? Well, it depends on how far East you want to go, but the percentage of Nobel Prize winners in sciences in Israel is higher than any place in the world per capita. Okay, I... Yeah, that's interesting. Israel, I don't know, I would consider that more part of the Western culture than Eastern, but I guess it's not, it could be <laughs> discussed uh, one way or another. But uh, but in terms of like the the you know what we think of as mainland China and um, uh, you know the central centralized government, the countries that have very centralized government. What you've got there is an enormous population, and even think about the way the Olympics work. You know, if you have a system that seeks out people who are good at something at one level and promotes them to the next level, keeps doing this, and you have a huge population, you're gonna have a whole bunch of winners. Uh, in the United States, we've, uh, now the Olympics uh, sports have been better supported now, but it used to be that you just train on your own and if you could do it, you could do it. It makes a, a great, and the same thing in, in terms of science and mathematics. If you're looking for people who are any good in science, and you give them the complete, the best education they can possibly get, regardless of their family income or regardless of anything else, you're going to get a whole bunch of really smart uh, mathematician scientists, as opposed to a situation in which you just say, well, you know, if they can afford it, that's good, but otherwise, too bad. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. I'm sure we could go uh, go on for a while and compare and compra con contrast the uh, different cultures as they exist today. Um, so it's been a fascinating discussion, and we really appreciate you coming on to give us the history of this and uh, answering our, our, our questions on it. It's been very uh, enlightening, um, and I think uh, the audience definitely appreciated it. So I don't know if you, uh, before we sign off, do you have any uh, final th thoughts or anything you want to sum up uh, uh, on, you know, on the very large topic? It's been a pleasure to me to have so many people with questions. I think people are listening, which is good. Yeah. Okay, great, F fantastic. We appreciate it. And for uh, thank you uh, to the audience for all your great questions.